Great. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation, listening to student voice to create opportunities for innovative learning experiences. We have two chat options, one on the right hand side of the screen and the other in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for the speakers, we would like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar for this purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking, asking your questions. If you, have, if you are asking a question to the speakers, please use a question mark at the beginning of the question. This makes it easier for us to scroll through and identify the questions. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for this session, Gary Chin, and we'll get started. Hey, thank you, Rosa, and welcome everyone um, to the last breakout of the day. Congratulations, uh, making it through the WCET annual day. Um, um, as Rosa mentioned, I'm Gary Chin, I'm the Assistant Dean for Digital Learning at Penn State or Pennsylvania State University. I'm also a WCET steering committee member, um, and I'd like to, uh, to welcome you all to this session uh, called Listening to Student Voice to Create Opportunities for Innovative Learning Experiences. And we're going to hear from uh, co uh, colleagues at the University of Texas San Antonio. Uh, I'm going to take a little time to introduce uh, the, the group, uh, and then we'll move into the presentation phase. Um, so uh, uh, Claudia Ar Arcolin is the Interim Executive Director for Teaching and Learning Experience within the Division of Academic Innovation and a lecturer in the Department of Interdisciplinary Learning and Teaching at UTSA. Um, Arcoline has been working in the field of education and instructional technology since 2003, gaining experience both in corporate and higher education settings in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, Jose Escobedo uh, serves as student body president at UTSA and is a senior in political science uh, from Mission, Texas. Uh, Jose has served in the University Student Government Association for the past three years and enjoys the opportunity to improve student well-being and share a student perspective. Uh, Marcela Ramirez is Interim Assistant Vice Provost for Academic Innovation at UTSA and leads a recent reorganization bringing together teaching and learning and digital learning into one unit, teaching, learning, and digital transformation that focuses on extraordinary support for faculty teaching in all modalities resulting in transformative and distinctive learning experiences for UTSA students. And Melissa Vito is a recognized higher education leader with over 35 years of experience in public higher education. She served as both Senior Vice President for Enrollment and Student Affairs and, and Senior Vice Provost for Academic Initiatives and Student Success at the University of Arizona, retiring in July of 2018, and currently serves as the Vice Provost for Academic Innovation at the University of Texas San Antonio. So I will hand it over to you. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Claudia is going to be kind of um, managing a lot of this, but I wanted to set a context for why we um, decided to do this session. And I thought I would do a, a brief, take you back in time to March of 2020, when we were all thinking about the quick move to remote and online education and how we were gonna do that. And from, I would say the moment that we started talking about this, we really changed the way that we think about what we do. And so we wanted to focus, all of us in our titles include things like teaching, teaching and learning, digital learning, but we really focus more on working with our faculty and have found ourselves less dynamically connected to students. And we knew as we were moving to a virtual environment that it was gonna be more important than ever that we find ways to connect with our students, to understand what their experience was, it was during that time and continues to be, and also to be set up in a way so that we could not only hear what they were experiencing, but quickly put that into practice so that it could we could actually inform how we were um, supporting our students and how we were working with our faculty. And so that was really where we started and um, was a super exciting time. We had multiple ways that we tried to think about the learning experience and to connect with students. We started pulse taking surveys uh, to regularly seek input from our students about 
you know, their confidence and how they were doing and what they needed. We also regularly surveyed faculty and in some instances found that both our faculty and our students were having the same experiences, but for different reasons. Uh, we also met with um, president's advisory groups. We set up focus groups. We started regular work with student government and to this day have continued this dynamic relationship. And I would say that um, of all the things that we've done to try to be innovative and to support in creative ways our faculty and our students, the work that we're doing with our students right now, I think brings to life what we do with our faculty in ways that none of us have ne necessarily ever experienced. And so that is the stage upon which we're going to talk about what we, we have been doing since then. And you'll hear from Claudia some about our surveys. Jose will talk to you because he actually is a student about, you know, what this means to them because we know so much of what we do is think we know what our students are experiencing, but we don't always know. And um, finally, Marcella will talk about what this means for our future. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. So we were talking about the Pulse Taken initiative. We started this initiative right in spring 2020, right at the onset of the pandemic. And we wanted to gather the faculty feedback and student feedback. And then we continue this pulse taking activity with Rowdy Pulse, another activity where we are interacting with a group of students to collect their feedback and identify not only how they feel, but what are some of areas of improvement. Um, we work closely with students and uh, we had identified focus groups and partnerships, for example, when we needed to assess digital tools or other initiatives to support uh, students and faculty at UTSA. So among all the different uh, um, data that we have collected throughout uh, this academic year, we would like to share today uh, four different findings and have a dialogue uh, with Jose, with you all, to understand how is the future of college and student experience. So we would like to start with uh, technology. Of course, in March 2020, uh, many courses uh, had to move online and students have to learn new technology and become online students. So we would like to share the results of uh, our post taking activity with students from fall 2020 to summer 2021, how the level of confidence with technology changed and uh, improved during these months. So, uh, Jose, uh, based on your experience and uh, the dialogue that you have uh, with um, other students, how did the level of confidence in technology change and in some way reshaped if it happened, the learning experience? Yeah, um, so I, I think the data speaks pretty clearly. Obviously, there was a positive change in, in confidence, right? So you can just see in fall 2020, very, very abysmal confidence in, in technology. I can say the same thing. I, I never even heard of Zoom. I was very, I might have heard of Skype before then, um, but it, it was just new to me. So obviously this year, we're all kind of Zoom masters at this point. Um, I think really what changed was, there was a positive change in, in confidence for technology, definitely. There was an opposite effect of confidence in, in more of those soft skills. Um, so when we came back to in-person, you know, there was a lot of like, anxiety about test taking skills, uh, interacting with students in the same class as you. And, um, it was, it's a weird time. But I think what kind of awoken us is, is this kind of flexibility around technology. Um, so I'm a senior at this point and, and take my answer with a grain of salt because this ch changes for, for everyone obviously, but um, for seniors and upper class in particular, we really, really enjoyed online learning just because we have a lot of things to do at, at this point. Uh, we got to work, we have internships. Um, online learning gave us the opportunity to be a full-time student and do what else we needed to do. So uh, I'm still continuing to take online learning right now. I, I just registered right now actually for next semester. I still have online classes. So it's still a big part of, of what we want and desire. Um, the opposite was true for freshmen, obviously, because right they had online high school basically. So obviously they're a little more keen to come back in person. Um, but the confidence overall has, has grown. It's just, it's decreased in certain areas. 
Uh, and those areas are concerning because that's a big part of what it means to be a college student. Thank you, Jose. And uh, when we were uh, thinking about how can we support our faculty, our students, we were thinking we do not just want to move our content uh, into Zoom and have live sessions. We had an investment in um, how can we um, disseminate effective teaching practices online? How can we help uh, faculty embrace universal design for learning principles and being able to create assessments and content that are going to let students demonstrate their knowledge through different uh, tools, means uh, way of engagement. So one of the things that we uh, surveyed both faculty and students was how is assessment designed? And uh, we asked students, what are some of the most popular online activities for learning? Uh, we had as a result that the most three uh, most popular activities are videos with embedded activities, individual assignment, interactive lessons, and then of course we have toward the end group project. Would you like to share more about these findings and uh, what are some of the takeaways that faculty should consider to design their courses? Yeah, so that, that's always a fun number to look at, right? Individual learning versus group projects. Um, yeah, I, you, know, you look at this data and, and you say, well, we just don't like group projects. We don't like working with other people. But I think it says more of we want to prove our, our own individual learning uh, as, as much as anything. So um, I think, and, and this is uh, on the bright side of the pandemic, right? Obviously, it's a lot of downsides. But on the bright side, um, this did awaken in, in us a certain need to look at different ways to teach and to learn. Um, and for students, you know, Again, we had never like had this kind of stuff before. And so for us, this is all new and it really helped. Um, personally, I really love those videos where it had closed captioning, where you can look back on it, or it was even like earmarked with different, like at this point in time, the stuff talking about the subject, so on and so forth. So there was an outline for it. So it was different and it was new and, and we really enjoyed it. Um, and so to us as students, you know, we want to keep exploring. When we came back, you know, I think some students were disappointed that um, some professors wanted to just keep it traditional because uh, now we're now we got a taste of of what it could be like, right? Um, so for us, it's it's important to keep experimenting. Now, us in particular, as a, a young university, it's 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 fun for us. We're a young university. There's no real two hundred year old precedent that we have to follow. Um, we have that luxury. I know for for bigger schools with with longer histories, they might be stuck sometimes with that. Um, but, you know, as professors, as, as faculty members, this could be fun for you too. You know, you might enjoy teaching, you know, your course in, in a different way that also might help students learn it better. Um, and this, this kind of shows that, right? So those interactive lessons online, um, it helps keep you on your toes and they are fun. Uh, and you don't have to do that in person. Uh, some students don't learn great in person. Um, and, and again, Going back on this group project, that group project number, that's not to say group projects aren't useful and, and students don't enjoy them. They enjoy them in certain contexts. Um, but when it really, really counts for the grade and it really counts for, for knowledge comprehension, um, I think we find that it sometimes hurts us more than, than helps. Uh, so in places where you really wanna see if there's individual mastery, obviously we're looking for more of those individual assignments. Um, but if you want us to get together and learn how to work in a group and work in a team and pull our own weight, um, Definitely group projects are, are the way to go. Again, just look at a different context, but it's a fun time in, in, in learning. We get to experiment now. Thank you. Uh, another thing that uh, we asked both faculty and students uh, was about uh, content creation. So in spring 2020, uh, UTSA made a huge investment on uh, infrastructure to support uh, different modalities of delivering content and courses. And so uh, we had different tools for interactive videos, interactive lessons, and uh, we are also an Adobe Creative Cloud campus. So faculty and students and staff, the entire UTSA community had the, um, have access to different apps to create interactive content. So one of the questions that we asked students was about the content. What are the most appreciated support 
for learning, uh, how content are designed and how faculty can interact with you. So we had questions about, we gathered feedback about discussions, shared workspace, weekly meetings with instructor, stress, health management sessions. Would you like to talk more about uh, these findings and what it means for our students? Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually, so here at UTSA, we're having discussions more about, you know, how do we interact between faculty and staff? Because again, in the pandemic, we're so used to seeing you all at home uh, and a professor would come and bring their cat to the camera or something. And it's just, it, it was a rare glimpse into their personal life. And um, now that we're back, you know, again, we, we're used to that connection with our professor, with our faculty, and there's a rare connection. Um, you can see here that there, there's a clear wanting to talk to our professors because at the end of the day, you're the experts. We want to learn from you more than anything. Uh, we want your unique experience. Um, but at the same time, we also want to do that in a comfortable setting. Uh, I, I think we're all trying to be more comfortable now. Um, and that's not, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the more comfortable you are, the more susceptible you are to learning new things or opening your mind. Um, again, it's all about experimenting now. Right? So even the, even the term office hours, is that really even the best way to call it? You know, is that, is that the best terminology? Is that off-putting for students? Um, so I, I've seen professors just have, call it different kinds of like synergy time or, or, or open door periods or something like that. So um, we don't want to lose that touch with our faculty because at the end of the day, it, it also affects you, right? Your humans too, your faculty. Um, if you're not comfortable in, in your own setting um, or you know, no one wants to teach to a classroom that you feel like they don't want to be there, right? So um, making that connection is important. It should, obviously it shouldn't be everything about the class. You start to get down to, the, to what you're teaching, but um, there should be some sort of connection and what that connection looks like could be different. You know, and again, this can be broken up by disciplines. Um, if you're a liberal arts major, obviously it's, there's a little more time, a little more um, cohesion there. If you're a science major or science faculty or, or STEM in general, obviously there's a little more rigid standards and expectations for teaching and learning, but that doesn't mean you have to be secluded or, or, or closed off from your students. Um, because in that field in particular, they, they definitely want your experience, right? They want to know how you got to where you are. Um, they want to know your mistakes because we all make mistakes, right? <laughs> um, so they want to learn from you as a person, as an expert, rather than just another faculty member, if that makes sense. That is uh, a great feedback. And uh, if we think about the initiatives that we supported for faculty professional development, we use this feedback from students to humanize our courses. Starting from the course design, um, we encourage faculty to include opportunities to, several opportunities to interact with students. Use uh, less formal uh, language, for example, for office hours call them uh, rather uh, support hours or uh, student support or just uh, space to share experiences, knowledge. We encourage to collaboration across different courses and uh, we encourage to have a strong communication, stay in touch with students uh, every week to update not just about the content but to share a little bit about who uh, your faculty are, uh, what are the values, the passion that they bring into the course. Of course, um, encouraging this type of uh, student instructor interaction, we had also to consider what was happening during the pandemic. And uh, some of the questions that we asked to faculty and to students were about stress, fatigue, burnout, and the level of stress in general from the pandemic to um, the spring, uh, the past spring semester. And we saw how this was uh, different and fluctuating. And uh, when we were preparing for this presentation, we had actually a very good con uh, conversation with Jose. And you were talking about uh, the importance of language when we we're talking about uh, stress. Would you like to, to talk more and share your opinion and perspective about this? Yeah, so I'm glad with that conversation. So. When you ask a student, you know, have you been stressed or, you know, are you, are you okay? Like, obviously they're going to say, yeah, we're okay. We're, we're getting through it. But if you ask them, you know, have you experienced burnout before? Most of the time they might know what it is, but most of the time they won't because we're just so used to like 
this high tent level of stress that we're, that we're used to. But burnout is very real and, and it affects virtually every college student. So if you had asked them that, I can guarantee you probably get like upwards of 80% uh, saying, yeah, they experienced burnout at least like five times throughout the semester. Uh, just because again, and this might be different for, for the colleges, but at least at UTSA, we're, we're working class student population, you know? So for most of our student population, you find that we work, we, we study, um, we do internships, anything we can to try, try and stay level and still be competitive. Um, so burnout is, is very real for us, um, especially for me. I, I felt it myself, you know, and I didn't know that until I actually looked up the symptoms of burnout um, and the actual effects of it. So, you know, and it's okay to acknowledge it, you know, especially in the classroom, um, because like I said, most students don't even know that they've experienced burnout. They just think it's regular stress and it's not. Um, I think we've internalized this, this sort of high stress capacity that, that we're so used to. And not just students, faculty too, right? I mean, you, you all have had to adapt and, and, and maneuver this pandemic. And to you, you just thought it's another job. Uh, it's another responsibility we've got to do. It's just, it's, it's another normal type of stress. But I've had faculty members that have experienced burnout too. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge that and we talk about it very honestly and openly. Because um, like I said, it has very real effects on students. It can deter them from, from ever wanting to learn again or even not even do their major. So um, it's it's scary when you actually look at it that way because um, it feels like a bubble. But again, if you just talk about it, it, it won't be too bad. Um, so the first step is acknowledging, right? So this is that, this is that step, acknowledging that burnout exists and we all experience it. I'm sorry, Dr. Cole. There you go. Yep. <laughs> the feedback that we received from students were, uh, was very helpful to start planning uh, professional development for faculty because we started thinking about we really need to think about student success, but also how to uh, include in our course design, in our professional development activities and opportunities for faculty to uh, engage with their students to help them uh, feel a sense of belonging, feel connected to uh, the campus. And we also uh, implemented several activities for students to support their learning. And uh, um, Marcella will talk a little bit more about some of the strategies that we have implemented to support and to enhance the learning experience. Thank you, Violia. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to um, take a few minutes to talk about, you know, some of the um, projects that we put together um, as part as where we were, where when we pivot to online 100% uh, and uh, we had kind of like conversations with our students and getting feedback from them about their readiness to, to study online. Um, also about, um, you know, the different tools that we suddenly acquired quickly uh, at the institution. And so how can we could enhance that digital literacy across campus and uh, make them feel comfortable in using the tools for their learning experiences? And um, also how did we support some of our um, graduate teaching assistants along the way when we enabled all of these technology tools and adding that innovative learning experience to it. And so the first one um, that we created was the student guide to online learning. And that came about, you know, from, from the feedback and experiences from students about some, the, major, the majority of them um, were not familiar with online learning. Our institution pre-pandemic didn't have as much uh, online learning offerings as, as other institutions. And so we really wanted to quickly pivot and create something um, like a student guide for, for, for our students. But what we did different is we actually had students created for other students. So we had our student developers actually create and, and curate content for the student guide. And it really was focused on creating sense of belonging to the university so that they wouldn't feel isolated as much during this time, you know, through the pandemic. And also giving them uh, tips on how to be a, an effective online learning student, as well as, um, you know, um, 
instructions and um, advice on how to set up the late, latest digital tools that we have. And so overall, it was to give them a better idea of what to expect in an online course throughout the rest of the semester. And we put that and launched that on fall 2020. And uh, we had over 800 students um, attend the student guide. And the majority of them were freshmen and sophomore and gave us great feedback on the, how it was help, super helpful to kind of like get an expectation on how to get started with our courses. And so that has continued to evolve. And now we are going to expand it. We're adding Adobe components as well. Um, so that we can have more digital literacy elements in there, as well as uh, focusing on all modalities, not just specific to online learning, because as we look into the future, we know that flexible learning will be key. And so we want to incorporate this as part of the student guide and expand it. Um, the second one is the Academic Integrity Project. So this one, um, as we were navigating through the pandemic, we enabled a an online uh, proctoring tool. And so um, as we were, you know, we're partners with the online proctoring tool, we were focusing on how to make the testing environment more inclusive and uh, also helping um, alleviate some of that stress that students were feeling were taking uh, an online test with, you know, the proctoring and the video and everything. And so we heard our students and we actually had a working group with students from Student Government Association as part of it um, to collect feedback and work on how to make it more inclusive. And so we did update a couple of features in the, in the online proctoring solution by, for example, removing the ID verification process and also uh, removing the pre-entry. Um, um, pre uh, they couldn't, um, what was it, the pre-entry of it. So if students had low uh, connectivity issues and they were kicked out of the test, they weren't able to jump back in. And so we removed that feature so that that wouldn't be a barrier for our students. And they could all like, they would only have to focus on taking the test and on their, um, on their um, kind of like the study uh, that they needed to do and not focus on the technology part of it of taking a test. And so in addition to that, what we set up also in partnership with the student feedback is uh, create an academic integrity course. And we wanted to help faculty rethink their assessments and um, kind of like create more authentic assessments. And in addition to that, we created a mock test using the online proctoring solution. So the faculty could take a test as a student and they could experience that, um, that learning part as well. And that helped out a lot. And faculty gave us a lot of feedback on that about after I took this mock test, I decided to change my testing uh, uh, to students and decided to use something else. So that was great feedback. And the last one is the Graduate Roadrunner Assistantship. That's something that we established this uh, past summer. And so we really focus on uh, creating um, an environment for our graduate teaching assistants where they could learn more about our digital tools and uh, focus on, you know, how to create powerful learning experiences, promote creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration. And so we had a, a week-long program. We had over 100 participants, and uh, they were really excited about, you know, uh, really expanding the, the, the digital literacy elements and inclusive pedagogy into those courses that they're uh, participating on. So that will continue to be something that will... Uh, offered this next summer and we're excited about it. And uh, other things that we are working on to humanize the learning experience is really about, uh, we're doing classroom technologies uh, projects. So we're upgrading our, our classrooms. And as we do that, and we have faculty working with us on um, implementing new teaching and learning practices in those classrooms, we're going to collect uh, student feedback so that we can kind of like think about what, what's next? What's the next innovative teaching and learning experience that we can offer through this classroom um, upgrades and that flexible learning environment with having students online and face-to-face. -face. 
And we're also doing a student faculty interaction program in partnership with student success. And so it's it's all about, you know, what Jose mentioned about the soft skills and going back into the classroom and, and um, you know, creating those connections. So we are establishing a pilot in, in spring 2022 about student faculty interactions so that we create unique opportunities outside of the classroom where they can connect and, and learn together. So those are some examples uh, of how we are uh, partnering and listening to our students um, in, with their feedback and, and trying to just help um, cultivate a more um, uh, like a culture, a, a positive culture on student learning. And that's what we want to do. Thank you, Marcela. I, uh, this is the presentation we have uh, prepared, but what we would like to, to do today is start a dialogue with you all, collecting your feedback as well, uh, collecting your questions and have a conversation um, with, with all the presenters to talk about how we can listen to student voice and implement uh, great activities, not just for faculty, but for students and improve the learning experience. One thing that I wanted to mention before we start questions is that actually during that summer of 2020, we were doing a lot of training with our faculty. We drew on student government to be part of our webinars and to be there talking to faculty. And I know when we talked to faculty, that was one of the best parts of the training. That's where they really found learning. And so I think for all of us, it really is, you know, among the things we learned, it's so important to have students personalize what's going on when we have issues and to make sure that they actually help us keep it real because some things sound great, but they really aren't that great. Or some things we aren't thinking about, you know, really are meaningful for students. And so um, I, I think that's been what's super important for many of us. But yeah, any questions or thoughts? I, I saw a little bit in the, um, the regular Zoom chat about the group projects, but other kinds of things? that you're interested in, that you'd like to check on? I think there was one question, Dr. Reed, on the chat. Oh, right. Oh, did they have to pay for the, did the, the question was whether or not the faculty had to pay for the sample proctor exam. They did not. <laughs> and so, no, they did not. It was, uh, it was simply um, a part of the process that we were trying to use to help faculty understand what it felt like super, actually super effective too, as Marcella indicated. And, and I would say parallel to working closely with student government, we work really closely with faculty governments also. And, and I mentioned this early on, but it's, it's a point that's worth thinking about. We frequently find that our faculty and our students are feeling a lot of the same things. They just don't know it. And so it, it's one of the ways we can think about our community. And if I could just say real quick, because I want to mention a couple of things, but I also want to tie it to Dr. Vita. I know you have a question for me about how does this look in the future, right? Like the next- Totally do. <laughs> yeah. So I, I see it as more of a two-pronged approach here. So the first one is is the mentality of learning on either end, and the second is more infrastructure-based. Um, to tackle the first prong, it, it's as it, easy as just talking. Um, you know, I, I know we like to over- think some, sometimes. And I, I tell some of my faculty members, like, don't overthink it. Like, you know, teach yeah. what you think is, is good to teach. But um, if you have something you want to try out, just ask the students. I mean, just ask us, hey, would you like to try this? Um, and, and what I really enjoyed about being able to talk to faculty is, like you mentioned, we have a lot of the same problems. We just don't really talk or we don't uh, bridge that divide. Um, so it's, and it's fun, you know, we get to talk to each other, we get to learn together uh, rather than trying to do our own, own separate thing apart. Um, so it's just a mentality of, of working together on this rather than you're the teacher up there and we're just here to listen. Because um, again, that, that's just the way it, it's heading towards. Um, it's inevitable really. So um, same thing with technology and the infrastructure part. Technology is not going anywhere. Um, I know Zoom was, was not fun to learn at the beginning, but we got it now. You know, It only took us about, what, a year or so? Uh, but we got it, we're getting there. Um, so, I mean, I mentioned this to, to them too, but my, my seven-year-old 
brother, right? He's he has like an iPad in his like second grade class. You know what I mean? So they are starting very very young. So if we can get ahead of the curve on this, the better. Because um, again, it's not going anywhere. So, uh, so so Jose, what do you if you just like think about your seven year old brother? What do you think he'll it'll be like for him when he starts college? I mean, not that anybody has a crystal ball, but just from your vantage point. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. I think it's going to look something that's completely unrecognizable to us right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think it'll be a lot of abstract learning. Um, yeah, I know we touched on this like, earlier, actually, a little bit, but there's going to be different ways to assess learning mm -hmm. and, and comprehension um, when, when he's in college. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we can teach him an exam all day, but is that the best way to, right. to, to measure that, right? So I know we're having that question now. By the time he's in college, I'm sure they're already going to have a few answers to that question. <laughs> um, but we're, we're the ones figuring it out right now, right? So we're the experiment. We're the guinea pig for my brother, um, unfortunately for us. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. We had a question in the chat, Marcella, about the accessing the online student guide. Do you want to, we, we have a, we can. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I was going to type in the chat uh, an email address, uh, Rick, where you can send us just um, uh, your information. And then I'll put it in the chat and then we'll talk to our Blackboard admins to see if we can give you access to it. Other kinds of questions or things that maybe some of you have done um, working with students. I'll, I'll tell you something that we thought would work really well that we learned. It did end up working, but not the way we thought. We, um, we among, among the things we wanted to do in the virtual environment was create opportunities for students to kind of archive their experiences through some of the courses they had. And, um, and so we, we used different methods, including um, Pressbook, as an opportunity for students to be able to actually put what they're learning into something that would be around for other generations. And we actually thought students would, that would be super easy because they already use social media and put so much out there. And, and honestly, we found out that it didn't work as well. Like it made students nervous to think about actually now having to formalize something. It took sort of the informal authenticity of just conveying what you're feeling out of it and um, was a really good kind of learning experience for us about how, again, how we think about how something is gonna work. And then actually when students are in the middle of a class experiencing it, it's not exactly what we thought, and, but made sense once we, once, once we actually were there. So, yeah. Other? We have a question about uh, communicating student feedback from other departments to faculty. That is actually one of the things that uh, we're most proud of because at the onset of the pandemic, we were able to create a network of college points of contact and uh, faculty champions, a faculty champion for each department. And uh, academic innovation worked very closely with this faculty to, um, to create this communication bridge and talk from uh, leadership to faculty and uh, from students to faculty, really to create this, uh, um, this system of communication and sharing information. And uh, the feedback that we collected from the post taking activities, we shared that with our UTSA leadership, uh, with the um, Faculty Senate, um, Academic Council, uh, with the Student Government Association, uh, with our faculty champions to really discuss about the different findings and uh, what they meant, how we could interpret these different uh, uh, perspectives and feedback the students and faculty were sharing to better support them. And uh, our uh, group of faculty champions uh, is also one of the uh, recipients of the uh, WOW Award. And uh, we're very, very proud to have them part of uh, our team and had the opportunity to work with them. Thanks, Claudia. We've got a question, which is a really good one from um, University of New Mexico, actually asking how we coordinated gathering the feedback, because we hear a lot that students are just over -sur surveyed. And, you know, we hear that at our institution also. And, it, you know, and in fact, they probably 
we're a little over surveyed when we think about it. Um, we tried to, um, we had a very active cadence during the early time of the pandemic. And then we kind of, um, you know, settled down into a less um, prolific amount of surveys that we were offering and have tried to really fine tune them to some really key questions that can help us make a difference in what we're doing. Um, and we use other ways to collect information. And so um, we do meet with student government regularly. We ask other students, you know, how they're feeling and try to develop kind of a network of informal and formal advice. We worked with um, student government and student success to set up a thing called Rowdy Pulse, which is really just asking one or two really quick questions that students can give us feedback on early on. Um, we'll have gift cards for them. We're using some classes, students in classes to volunteer to do that. We'll continue to fine tune it, but we make it as simple as possible to just give us a little quick feedback about something we're trying to understand. And frequently, and I know we all know this, that's enough for us to act on. We don't, we're not writing dissertations or necessarily publishing a research article. It is just simply to try to understand what's happening in the moment. And so we've tried to kind of shrink the number of surveys and then also shift to some quick and dirty couple questions we can ask that, that'll give us some feedback. But I, Jose, from a student perspective, how over surveyed do you feel? <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was gonna say, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think for us, it's not an issue of being surveyed. It's the issue of feeling like our answers are going like into the void. Right. You know what I mean? And so for students, we don't mind getting any feedback as long as we know that there's being action taken. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for us, we're lucky enough that, you know, the, we gave feedback on Proctorio, there was immediate action and everyone can feel the impact, right? Um, so for that kind of thing, it's, it's easier because you can actualize that impact. You can see it physically. Um, it's harder when you ask questions like, you know, how can we do better or, you know, right. Cause, cause you know, then you have to like, see how does that, how does that work for different departments and stuff? So for students, you know, as long as our feedback is being taken into account and we can see that it's, it's, it's changing things, we can be served all day. You know, I'll, I'll take any survey you want me to take. Um, <laughs> and again, it looks different for every department. So it might have to be like more personal conversations about how your impact, how your, how your input is actually affecting change. But, um, you know, for us, I know we're, we did this whole you know, survey that we did for student input. It's a big survey, but we're, we're doing a town hall pretty soon here too um, to actually show the students, hey, this, these are your results that we got from you. So let's hear, let's hear about it. Let's talk about it. Um, so for students, you know, we don't mind taking surveys. We can take surveys. Just show us that you're actually going to do something with it. Um, and that's a little harder, but again, that's why you have student government, that's why you have different student groups that, that can help you actualize it and implement uh, that data. Because a lot of times it's it's general data that on paper looks weird, but if you just ask a student, like, what does that, like, what does that mean? Like, oh, well, that means, you know, um, like, like with a stress survey example, right? You know, like I mentioned, stress can mean different things to students, but if you, if you mention burnout, right, you get different results. So that's, that's how we feel. <laughs> Right, it's the feedback loop, and then actually taking it into action. Yeah. Other kinds of questions, some other thoughts? Students were great. Marcella talked about the classroom technology project. We are working on a number of upgrading classrooms, and as we were starting it, you know, students gave us feedback about furnishings, movable chairs, you know, a, a kind of an array of things um, along with faculty that did help, has helped inform what we're doing. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question about like more up from Christina about how do we communicate student feedback from other departments to faculty? I think, uh, I think actually Claudia talked some about that um, in terms of using our intact groups through the faculty champions and points of contact. And then also we do present, and Claudia mentioned this, um, regularly at faculty senate and academic council. And so we try to get, and we have a faculty newsletter that goes out every, um, every weekly, every Monday, um, that we also use as a way to kind of convey um, basic information about findings or other kinds of issues. And so it's, kind of, it's not perfect, but we try through multiple ways to get the word out.
We have another question uh, from Portland Community College. Did you find your college advising, enrollment support, counseling, etc., also working on improving the remote support? Uh, I would say yes. It was. It's interesting. I, I think um, the pandemic accelerated the um, the movement in that area. We I work also part of the academic innovation is our fully online. Um, uh, programs. And so we had already been working in some areas, but advising quick, quickly shifted to um, a remote model and they're continuing to now be hybrid. Um, enrollment support the same way, counseling the same way. And I think, um, I think what's happened in all of those services, and we have a really strong um, dean of students, is that um, they've, they're probably never going to go back to only face to face, and so I think it it actually jettisoned those services into a more modern model, which is meets our student needs better. But I don't want to talk. I mean, Jose, what do you think? So I actually work at the advising center, and so I, I've seen firsthand like the pivot. Um, so it's done in a couple of ways, right? So obviously you have your 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 front people, the ones that actually take the initial calls from the enrollment services or counseling. Um, and we found that a lot of those people can work from home and we enjoy working from home because um, we can just as easily take calls or, or schedule appointments uh, while we, you know, we just, we're, we're just doing different things. Um, on the other half of that, that's the actual, like, you know, full-time staff, like the, the actual counselors and, and advisors. Uh, that's a little different. So at least for advising, we found that some advisors actually prefer doing over Zoom. Uh, just because for them, one, it's safe, right? In, in a pandemic, it's, it's very safe. And two, they can still like show their screen, they can present and, and actually highlight and show them. Um, or the student can show their screen, like show what they're seeing. So it might be different. So for them, you know, it didn't change too much. They can still do everything they could do before, but online. And so some prefer that. Um, on the other hand, some do prefer in person just because they prefer that personal touch or for... Uh, we have some advisors that, that need to be in person because they, they're impaired in some way. So they need to have in-person meetings. And so, you know, we, we just pivot. Um, but as far as, you know, remote support goes, you could, again, we're experimenting, right? We, we find that as long as we're still helping students and students are still feeling like they're being helped, you know, it's a win-win for all of us. Um, but it's about asking that question, do you feel like you're being helped? Like the same way. Um, and it could just be a simple question like that. Do you, do you feel like you're getting the same support as pre-pandemic? Um, so just, just ask, I, I think, you know, we have pivoted quite well. Again, this is different for every department. It's different for different services, but for the most part, we're doing just fine. And we're doing a whole conference over zoom, you know, so, <laughs> um, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. And uh, Jose, you talk a lot about we are experimenting. So uh, what we tried um, with MD Teaching, Learning and Digital Transformation team, we have a team working for design and development, and we encourage faculty to include anonymous survey into their courses to ask how students are doing in the course, what are some of the things that, for example, if in the course there are new tools implemented or new teaching strategies, but also if the instructor is doing something new that uh, never uh, did before. For example, we uh, started the first cohort of uh, AQ for effective online teaching practices and effective teaching practices. And right now we have another one for inclusive teaching for equitable learning. And we're encouraging faculty to share this with their students, to let them know I'm doing this to improve my, um, my teaching and to help you be, uh, be more successful, enjoying the learning experience. So just share with your students if you're experimenting uh, something new and uh, the feedback the students share, it's great. And it starts like uh, a collaboration to improve the course design, teaching strategies, everything really. Definitely, I mean, and I think again, for the faculty, like it's, it might be a refresher, you know, if, if you've been teaching for like 10 plus years, obviously like, you do the same thing a lot over and over again, but it, it might be refreshing to try something new and, and you find that it actually works, you know? So it's, it's, it's beneficial for us and for you. Um, 
so and just to name a couple of examples, like if you know, some professors found that they don't even need a textbook anymore, or they can just get excerpts online or give articles or give interviews. Um, for one of our classes, we one of our assignments was just to listen to a podcast. That was really informal, um, but really informative. So, you know, again, that helps us in so many ways, and we're still learning. And and if anything, we feel more connected to the subject. And I, I also wanted to say, like, the more connected you can make a, a student to the subject that they're learning, the better. I mean, a lot of the times we we pick a major because we just feel like that's what we need to do. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of biology students pick biology just because they want to be pre-med. And so that's just what they assume they have to do. Uh, another, I'm, again, I'm another example. I want to do law school, so I pick political science because, again, I just assumed, hey, that's what everyone does. Um, but here I am, my senior year, thinking, I think I should have chosen something else because I enjoy something else now. And I'm just finding out about it. But I can still do what I want to do. It's just, you know, having that connection is important, more important than, than you could possibly know. Because right now we're, we're figuring out the rest of our lives. Um, it's kind of difficult uh, to, to, under, to understate a little bit. But um, if you can show them an insight into what they're learning and, to, and why they're learning it, the better. Um, so, yeah, thank you. That's <laughs> I, I just want to touch on that before before we end it. Questions or or any of you who've done something particularly, um, you know, that worked really has worked really well to engage your students or anything. I know you've been sitting through sessions, so we appreciate your hanging with us. I had, a, I had a quick question because you mentioned um, the Adobe Creative Campus mm -hmm. and digital fluency. Um, whether or not you have kind of perceived any, or if, if you think there might be some kind of accelerator impact of what we've all had to go through for the last, uh, you know, year and a half, two years, uh, on just an openness to engage with those kinds of digital tools, either on the or maybe both on the faculty and student side, and, you know, it seems like it might be a really um, interesting moment to be having this kind of university-wide ubiquitous access to digital tools at, at a time when we've been more reliant on digital as a modality than perhaps we had before. You know, Gary, that's an awesome question, and I think everybody will probably want to answer some piece of it. Um, I think, um, I think what what what's happened is that we're trying to we're trying to change the conversation from modality and really focus on learning. And so when we think about tools, particularly like Adobe or or some others um, that we've used, they really link to what the learning teaching and learning experience is. You know, whether it's face to face or virtual. But we did find we actually UTSA participated in a research um, project that Civitas Learning conducted that tried to look at the impact of using things like Adobe Creative Cloud in, in courses. And we actually found positive impact on um, grades and mastery, so kind of higher level of grades and, um, and actually even term to term um, persistence um, for those students who were in courses where it was used. And so, you know, we, we know it made a difference. So we, we have roundtables of faculty who use Adobe so they can kind of share ideas, but also we use, you know, I mentioned Pressbook and Padlet. And I mean, we, we incorporated an awful lot of things that were, that are tools that focus on improving the teaching and learning experience. I think now we're starting to kind of pause a minute and think about where we've had the most impact and where we keep going. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in. It is that it is that moment, though, I think, which has been kind of fun. Anything, any other questions, thoughts, ideas, random thoughts from the, from Marcella, Claudia, Jose? 
me, it has been a great experience working with students. When we started the pandemic, we were thinking about, first we were thinking about technology. Then we were thinking about how can we support faculty? And um, it was, um, we were thinking about what could work and we were planning how to design the learning experience and improve the learning experience and engage our students without engaging our students. So when we started really uh, the, the collaboration with Jose, with the Student Government Association, um, we started um, connecting, connecting with other students. It changed completely the perspective. And even when uh, we talk with faculty, we bring the student experience. Everything is about the students and how we can support them. So it's really something that uh, changed the way we were planning our professional development for faculty, uh, the adoption of new tools, our design and development process. So I just want to thank Jose and uh, the Student Government Association, all the students who have provided uh, great feedback, insightful feedback to, to support uh, UTSA and our community. And if I can touch a little bit on, on what student government does, and again, this might be different in every institution, but at the end of the day, we are the representative body for the students, right? At least that's what we're supposed to be. Um, and so I, I can't overstate the importance of just reaching out every now and then and, and touching base, um, just because, well, at least for us, again, this might be different for everyone else, but we have specific Senate seats reserved for specific types of students. So for us, we have senators from every college and every classification. Um, so for us, it's, it's beneficial to have that representative body. Um, again, this might be different for your institution. Um, I, I would encourage you just to take a look every now and then and just see what they're up to. Um, you'd be surprised just how involved they can actually be. Um, at least on the executive level of student government, you know, we meet regularly with, with vice presidents, with, with different departments and, and with faculty and staff students. So we're more connected and more, more involved in, you know, what you might realize. So it doesn't hurt to just tap our shoulder every now and then. Um, something that our university benefits from it is that shared, shared experience. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be here today, but this is a regular thing for us. You know, we collaborate all the time um, and it's fun. And we feel like we have a stake in our learning. And at the end of the day, that's important for us. Again, things are changing. Um, students are, are wanting to be more involved and, and take more control. Um, however that might look like in 10 years, I don't know, but for now, uh, I'm liking it, so. Marcella, any, any last parting thoughts? Yes, I, I just wanted to, you know, echo what Jose said about like, it's fun. It's been a, a, a lot of fun to partner with them and create these unique experiences. Um, I really enjoy it. And, you know, it has become part of our process. So it comes natural to us now to really, um, you know, connect with, with Student Government Association with Jose and talk about, our, you know, our brainstorming ideas and go from there. So I just wanted to to share that because I would I would encourage kind of like other institutions to do that. Um, it really opens up your eyes on kind of like that learning experience and and really the creativity side of it. It's great. I, I love that part as well. So just wanted to share that. We'll, we're gonna, we'll be moving into a new academic innovation center, hopefully in the spring. And actually we're located kind of right across the hallway from um, student success area. So it's gonna create a really great synergy and we're building in space to create opportunities to draw students in along with, I'm trying to get like a coffee cart or something there um, to help, you know, to help bring students and faculty together and to play with ideas and tools and to feel, feel more engaged. I, you know, it's, um, it, it is, it is what matters at the end of the day. And I, I think we're putting, you know, learning back into teaching and learning um, as, a, a, which I think has made, made a, a big difference. And, and, you know, student feedback has helped drive our reorganization too. And so we really appreciate that. But we're, you know, happy to give you anything else, any other um, stuff that we can do to help out where we are around. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to our speakers. Um, I'm going to do my little, uh,
my little Zoom applause. Um, <laughs> and, um, and thank you for everyone for attending and your attention. Just a reminder, we do have the closing social right after this. Um, so if you have any more energy and you want to, you know, have maybe a little bit more unstructured time, please pop over there. Uh, again, thank you to the UTSA team. Amazing work. And I uh, really appreciate uh, sharing your stories. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for attending this session. And a huge thank you to our presenters and moderator. A session feedback survey should be popping up, and we would really appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. And the speakers enjoy receiving your feedback. Uh, we recorded the session, and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us now for a fun networking social to close out the day. And thank you all.